Moral virtues are acquired by repeated acts of a given kind. That is, we acquire a habit. We acquire a habit. This is why virtues and habits tend to be linked. Virtue is a kind of habit, a good one, as opposed to a bad one. But we, by dint of repeated actions of a certain kind, are inclined so to act in the future. And if we don't uh, acquire good habits, we're going we're going to have bad habits, such that it's going to be very difficult for us not to keep doing uh, the wrong uh, the wrong thing. But in either case, it's going to be a matter of habituation of uh, of a far more existential orientation of ourselves than when we learn something. So that uh, what we can say here is that when we're learning, what do we do? We change our mind from not knowing to knowing or from agreeing to uh, disagreeing to agreeing, let's say, with a, with a particular claim because now we see the reason for uh, the claim that is being made. So we change our mind. But when we're talking about the moral virtues, we're talking about changing our lives. Huh? We're talking about something that is not simply a matter of seeing something. Uh, there's nothing easier for us, uh, perhaps, uh, than to, well, uh, it's easier for us to understand uh, moral advice than to abide by it. Uh, Kierkegaard gives the, uh, trying to make the same distinction, trying and succeeding, uh, gives the example of uh, a uh, recruit in the army uh, who is talking in ranks and the sergeant says, shut up, don't talk in rank. And he says, I understand what you're saying. You mean when we're standing here in a row like this, we shouldn't be talking. And he says, shut up. He said, yeah, that's I, I got you. I understand that. And what Kierkegaard is, is drawing attention to is this, that there's a kind of understanding that is a misunderstanding. Uh, the way to uh, answer a command is not to uh, uh, is not to give an analysis of it or to tell the commander what it was that he was saying, but in this case, in point, simply to shut up. Uh, so it is with uh, with uh, uh, practical advice, and so it is with the acquisition of the moral virtue. Uh, we can understand, let us say, a book of ethics. You and I can read the Nicobian Ethics, and in some sense can be moved by it in the way in which we can be moved by uh, acts of heroism, let's say, on the stage or, or in a movie, but that doesn't make us courageous, does it? So, too, we can read the Summa and we can imagine ourselves uh, acquiring these virtues that are being talked about, but that isn't the way they're acquired, by imagining them or, or uh, reading about them. There's only one way to do it, and it's a long, difficult way of acquiring them by repeated acts of a certain kind. So there's a great difference between uh, moral virtue and intellectual virtue. But again, let me just underscore this uh, seeming paradox. The moral virtues are what? They are the bringing of the emotions under the control of reason. The two major moral virtues that Aristotle distinguishes, and we'll be coming back to this when we talk about the cardinal virtues, are temperance and fortitude. Uh, and what temperance does is to bring our desires uh, bearing on the pleasurable under the sway of reason so that we feel desire whether we want to or not, but how we act uh, in uh, the presence of that desire is up to us and that's what we're responsible for. But obviously if we constantly are giving in to our desires, uh, we're, we're uh, habituated to act in that way and we're even less likely uh, to be able to make a uh, rational judgment as to what we ought to do prevail uh, over our emotion. Uh, but generally, that's what Aristotle means by a moral virtue, to humanize the emotions, uh, not to be controlled by them, but to, to integrate them uh, into our lives in such a way that they serve the overall good, the ultimate end uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the human agent. But that paradox that this is the, uh, the perfection of rational activity in only an extended sense of the term, that is, participated rational activity, whereas the perfection or excellences of rational activity in the essential sense of the term are virtues only in a secondary sense. Why is that? Well, it, it has uh, a lot to do with, uh, with the way in which we define virtue. Uh, take Aristotle's definition of virtue. Virtue is that which makes the one having it good and renders his activity or operation good. 
that just summarizes, doesn't it, the function analysis that we've been, that we've been uh, talking about. But what you'll notice about that definition is the recurrence of the term good. And good is the object of appetite, of desire, of uh, our impetus towards things, whereas the true is the object of intellection, of cognition. Cognition has, has achieved its term, by and large, if it arrives at the truth of the matter. Uh, whereas uh, appetite uh, is, is drawn towards things as they, as they are in themselves. So insofar as good enters into the definition of virtue in the way in which it does, appetite is going to be the seat of the virtue. Uh, in the primary uh, sense of the term. And in the case of the intellectual virtues, we have the capacity, as Thomas uh, says, to act well, but we don't have the inclination uh, to use that capacity well simply by dint of having it. I may know uh, geometry uh, well, but I don't, just by dint of having that skill, that intellectual skill, I don't have the disposition to use it well. Uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, bitter truths is uh, that we can become highly adept uh, at knowledge of the natural world and at technology and so forth, and uh, we worry about that kind of uh, possession uh, of uh, technical knowledge, maybe not in ourselves, but at least in others, because of how easily uh, it can be put to a bad use. So the skill itself or the intellectual virtue itself does not dispose us to act well Whereas the moral virtue, since it has its seat in appetite and in our orientation towards the good, is by definition a disposition uh, to, uh, to act well. But at any rate, what we have here now uh, is on the basis of the plurality of meanings of rational activity, we have a plurality of virtue. And what we now have to ask ourselves is, do we just have a lot of virtues, or are they related to one another uh, in terms of some kind of hierarchy? And despite what I've just said, it's going to turn out that on one hierarchy of the virtues, the intellectual virtues, which are less virtues than the moral virtues, uh, come uh, out uh, on the highest uh, rank. But we'll be talking about